You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, award-winning volunteer for Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jeremy. Today is June 25th, 2023, and this is episode 231 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we'll listen to a conversation about the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act with three people who play a role in that process. We're also going to chat about the Lighthouse Dance event we're planning for August. So, uh, before we introduce today's first interview, has anything interesting happened on this date in lighthouse history, Cindy? Yes. On June 25th, 1999, the Rose Island Lighthouse Foundation purchased most of Rose Island near Newport, Rhode Island from private owners. Today, the foundation welcomes visitors to the lighthouse for tours and overnight stays. The island is accessible by ferry from Newport and Jamestown. Yeah, I love Rose Island. Mm. I've been there many times over the last 30 years. Let's see, I'm trying to think. The first time I was there was in the late 80s, so it's, it's been... Wow, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've stayed overnight a couple of times. People can learn more about the overnight accommodations and the tours there by going to roseisland.org. So, Cindy, please help me introduce our guests, our first interview for today. Sure, Jeremy. The National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000, or NHLPA, was created to aid the preservation of federally owned historic light stations. The NHLPA program is a partnership that includes the Coast Guard, the National Park Service, and the General Services Administration, or GSA. The NHLPA allows lighthouse properties to be transferred at no cost to federal agencies, state and local governments, nonprofit corporations, or educational and community development organizations. Kevin Laguerre, Sonia Alon Singh, and Anthony Barbati are realty specialists for the GSA, working out of the GSA's New England region offices in Boston. All three of them are involved with the lighthouse properties that are currently up for transfer. I spoke about all aspects of the NHLPA with Sonia, Anthony, and Kevin just a few days ago, so let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with three people at the GSA's New England Region offices in Boston. I'm speaking with Sonia Alon Singh, Anthony Barbati, and Kevin Laguerre. And uh, Sonia, Anthony, and Kevin, I really appreciate you joining me today. Thanks so much. Thanks for, Thanks for having us. Let's, uh, of course, we're going to talk about the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, the GSA's role in all that, and the lighthouse transfers and so forth. But uh, first, let me ask a more uh, a broader question, more general question. I know it's probably hard to answer this briefly, but could somebody tell me what is the GSA, the General Services Administration? Uh, what does the GSA do in general? Who wants to take that? I'll take a stab at that, Jeremy. This is Sonia. Um, so the General Services Administration is a centralized procurement office for the federal government. So we offer real estate, technology, contract and management products and services to other federal agencies. There are two main parts of GSA. Uh, there's the Federal Acquisition Services, which is America's only source solely dedicated to procuring goods and services for the government. And then there's the Public Building Services, which is where we fall under. And it's the largest public real estate organization in the country. Mm. Um, our clients are federal agencies and our mission is to assist other federal agencies in utilizing their real estate to more efficiently leverage the value of their real property portfolio. And so we provide real estate services for all aspects of a transfer or any real estate transaction. We work with buyers, local communities, environmental regulators, state and congressional representatives and other stakeholders um, to fulfill real estate transactions. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Yeah, it's uh, it's a hugely important function, obviously, and it's uh, something average people probably don't think of on a daily basis, but you do so much uh, important stuff in this country. So uh, let's get into the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000. 
Uh, the act again was passed in 2000. I believe it was signed by President Clinton at that time. So I don't know who wants to take this question, but why was the NHLPA, we'll refer to it from now on as the NHLPA, National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, why was that set up in the first place? What was the reasoning behind it? And uh, how does it work well, without going into tremendous detail, the basics of how the NHLPA works? Hey, Jeremy, I, I, Kevin, I, I'd be happy to jump in there. The NHLPA, uh, it, it sometimes is confused with the uh, National Hockey League. <laughs> yes. Yeah, if you do a Google search, I think uh, National <laughs> Hockey League will come up. Yeah. Right. But uh, now the, the, our version of the NHLPA was born out of the National Historic Preservation Act. And so that amendment back in 2000 to now include lighthouses uh, is where we now recognize the significance of these light stations for you know, maritime traffic, for the coastal communities, and for the not-for-profit organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the first time that a not-for-profit organization is on the same kind of standing with regard to uh, being in the same pool of candidates uh, that would be qualified to take the light under the NHLPA. So it was really born out of the NHPA, an amendment, and the guide behind it, Jeremy, is preservation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the preservation of that historic light property uh, and what it's meant, what it means going forward. That's the beauty of it. Uh, it was set up out of the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, and it works uh, with three levels of federal government uh, between the GSA the Coast Guard and the National Park Service. Uh, the program puts these historic lighthouses back into a productive reuse without bothering the aid to navigation. These three agencies play a role in this NHLPA to divest of these lights out into the, you know, the real, the real world, private hands, that kind of thing. Uh, and 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 so that. That, uh, that three, three levels of, of the federal agency under this program, uh, we all sit under that umbrella uh, and we operate in different lanes, but in the end, uh, the idea is to transfer the light uh, to the appropriate entity that could then maintain, preserve, keep it available to the public, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's all about preservation out of the NHPA. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned uh, the Coast Guard again, their role in the process. They uh, as I understand it, when a lighthouse uh, is going to go into this process, the Coast Guard first declares it as uh, excess property, the, it goes uh, for disposal. I think that's the, the word that's used. Although, as you mentioned, in most cases, the uh, lighthouse is still retained as an aid to navigation. So the Coast Guard will continue to maintain the light and the fog signal if there is one, the navigational equipment is still maintained by the Coast Guard, even if uh, ownership actually goes to another entity. Do I have that part right? That is correct, yeah. And, and, and the National Park Service ensures that the property, the historic character of the property would be maintained. So that, mm -hmm. again, they're, they're all levels of preservation in, in keeping that asset uh, that way going forward. Yeah, so if somebody applies uh, under the NHLPA to uh, get ownership of a, a light, lighthouse property, the application is actually reviewed by a, a committee in the National Park Service. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Uh, reviewed and approved, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. They're the they're the approving. A, a, you know, we GSA provide them the interest, and they then vet that interest and approve that candidate for the light. Okay. So uh, some people, you see newspaper headlines pretty often saying, you know, uh, lighthouses being sold by the federal government. And usually they're talking about the, the transfers, which are usually to nonprofits at no cost. But uh, some lighthouses ultimately are auctioned uh, through this process. So they actually are uh, sold for varying amounts of money. Why do some lighthouses end up being auctioned by the, by the government? I'll take this one, Jeremy. Um, Anthony here. So yeah, as you said, you know, I think the mistake, the mistake happens with people um, thinking these transfer ones are up for sale is, is just because of the media attention, right? Catchy headlines, get lots of clicks, can't fault them. So yeah. <laughs> no hard feelings. Um, but the ones that are auctioned, um, they've all been processed already under the NHLPA. And in some instances, that application process doesn't produce a qualified entity, a uh, new grantee. And 
there's various reasons. Maybe they they didn't have a strong application packet. Maybe it just maybe the lights in an austere environment didn't get an applicant. And once we're past that, and the National Park Service, you know, decided there's no um, new grantee. You know, those are the candidates that are now up for public sale, and they'll undergo you know a marketing phase and then go to make their way to our auction platform, much as our other disposals do. Yeah, I think you uh, referred to location being being a major factor in a lot of these cases. Uh, what will often happen is some of the really remote, hard to access lighthouses, I think, uh, don't tend to get uh, many applications. The ones often rocks, you know, several miles out in the ocean and that kind of thing. It's a kind of a daunting thing to take those on for a small nonprofit. So uh, those are largely the ones that have ended up being auctioned examples people i know actually uh own uh, halfway rock lighthouse in maine uh, graves light in boston harbor those are a couple of examples of ones that were auctioned and have been taken uh, good care of by their private owners who bought them so um as you said uh, location uh, often has a lot to do with that so does somebody uh want to take uh, the question of how many, I don't know if you have an answer to this, it doesn't have to be an exact number, but how many lighthouses have been transferred so far into the NHLPA? I can answer that, just under 150, with an equal balance being from the Great Lakes region, those states out there, and up and down the East Coast from Maine to Florida, so mm -hmm. pretty robust offering of lighthouses so far. Yeah. And that's uh, including both the the transfers at no cost and the auctions. Is that including both? Yes, that's correct, Jeremy. Yes, um, yeah. I would say with about seventy five percent of that amount being a public sale. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, so it's uh, in twenty two years. Uh, about 150, and I think the current group of uh, is it is it eight currently that are up for either for for transfer or auction just been announced recently. Is that the largest group at one time? I believe it is. Correct, yeah, yeah. we pushed out 10 actually. 10, okay, yeah. yeah. Again, uh, I don't know who wants to grab this, but how, what role do you individually play, specifically you guys, uh, what role do you play in this, uh, in this program? I'll take it, Jeremy, again, Kevin. Uh, uh, much like what we talked about earlier, GSA's role is administering the interest in this property, putting the word out with the notice of availability, uh, then culling that interest into a manageable group for the, for the site inspection. Uh, and then from there, the National Park Service takes on their role of the application review and approval. When that process is concluded, GSA then steps in for a deeding action and or a public sale. Mm -hmm. So the three of us are busy with our individual lights. We're in the process of that notice of availability is out there and, and we are managing the interest currently. And you get a lot of inquiries uh, that are actually directed to you, people with questions about these properties. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. robust interest. Uh, good. Well, that's good yeah. to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sonia, let me let me ask you about this. Uh, there are really some some very prominent light stations for lighthouse buffs. Uh, I'm sure they're aware of a lot of these places, ones that are currently up for transfer. And Sonia, you're the the realty specialist for the GSA working uh, with two in Connecticut, actually one in Connecticut, Lynn Point Lighthouse and uh, Knobska Point Lighthouse on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Those are two pretty well-known light stations. Both of those places I know used to have resident Coast Guard families, but the Coast Guard has done this a lot of these with a lot of these places where they've had Coast Guard families. The lights are automated, of course, so they're not really keepers anymore, but they, they had Coast Guard families living at these places. They've mostly stopped doing that at these places. Nobska, uh Light on Cape Cod, I know has a uh, nonprofit already involved with it is helping to manage the property and is trying to develop a, a museum on the keeper's house. So I'm just, I'm sure they'll be applying for ownership through this program, but I'm wondering uh, from you if, uh, if the fact that this group is already in, very involved with the lighthouse, does that g give them any kind of uh, leg up, uh, an advantage in the process when they apply for it? Yeah, so the National Park Service, like Kevin said, created and administers the application. And being a current or former occupant 
doesn't necessarily give you extra points in getting, there's no area in the application that says, have you currently or formally occupied this lighthouse? But right. what it does do is it provides evidence of your ability to maintain, restore, use the lighthouse to uh, best benefit the public, historically preserve it. So having that and showing evidence that you can do it will be factored into the re the review and the approval of the application. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Anthony, uh, Sonia pretty much answered the question, so I don't know if you want to add anything, but I know you're the uh, point person for Plymouth Light Station in Massachusetts. Uh, also known as Gurnet Light, a place that I've been to a number of times. I know it quite well. And actually, a good friend of mine is actually the president of the uh, the group, the Project Gurnet and Bug Lights. They recently got ownership of uh, Duxbury Pier Light, also known as Bug Light, in that same area uh, on, through the program. So I'm wondering if uh, you're kind of working with them in this process at this point? Yeah, so fun light near and dear to me. I grew up in Duxbury. Um, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, working with them, I mean, yeah, there's a lessee. So, you know, their general point of contact for opening the light, doing inspections, you know, working with them might be a, a more, I don't know, harder term than I would use, but we're in contact, especially because, you know, there's some unique um, characteristics with this light, especially given there's threatened species going up the beach road, um, which prevents access. And then the beach is privately owned, but rented to the town. Um, there's a couple layers, especially when it's time to show the inspections where, you know, they'll need to be involved helping facilitate it with contacts in the local governments and nonprofits that own the beach. So, I mean, working together might be strong, but we're definitely in contact. Sure. Okay. You mentioned uh, endangered species there uh, on the, the road to the, the Gurnet there. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be talking about piping plovers, I believe. I so. am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's favorite. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, cases uh, where a lot of, in a lot of places, a lot of lighthouse locations, those uh, play a role in the whole thing. So uh, let me, you just mentioned inspections, site inspections, where the public uh, interested uh, people can, can inspect these places. Do you, do the three of you get to take part in those inspections, those site we, visits? We do. We um, usually, there's a few of us there. I I guess it really depends on the interest amount, but usually there's a couple of us there. Maybe the National Park Service joins and the tenants open it up, and um, you know, we host inspections and field field questions really for the interested parties. It's kind of their opportunity to see the property and really um get to ask us in person what maybe they didn't via email or on spot questions. Yeah, I've actually been on a couple of those uh, inspection visits with GSA people in the past. Uh, I don't know if if uh, any or all of you knew Mita Cushing, who I think uh, recently retired who uh, was involved in this process for, for years and years. I was on a Coast Guard boat with her all day, uh, going to a couple of lighthouses in Maine uh, more than 15 years ago now. So uh, that's a very memorable day in my lighthouse yeah. travels. Yeah, we climbed up the ladder at uh, Goose Rocks Light in, uh, in mid-coast Maine. That was, that was fun that day. Kevin, you kind of answered this already, but it sounds like you're getting a lot of interest in this current group of lighthouses that's up for transfer. Is that right? Yeah. And when, and when you say up for transfer, Jeremy, specifically under the NHLPA. Right. Uh, yeah. It, it's been unbelievable, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, each light is getting an enormous amount of interest. So uh, Very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, again, after the site inspection, it, it would most likely whittle down with regard to the ability to take on a historic property like this, you know, in, mm -hmm. in perpetuity. Yeah. So Sonia, I have another question for you. We mentioned a couple of the properties you're, you're involved with, but another one is uh, little Mark Island, uh, which is not usually referred to as a lighthouse. I uh, refer to it as the little Mark Island monument in Casco Bay in Maine. It's a stone structure. It's a, it's a, close to 200 years old i forget the exact year it was built but uh it's a it was built as a stone uh day marker day beacon but a light was added later but it's certainly not a traditional lighthouse uh very historic property is that creating any confusion or how what what kind of reaction is that place getting at this point that's a good question most of the interest in little mark island and monument 
has been of people in the area, so they are familiar with it. And like you said, it's not a traditional lighthouse. It's a pyramidal stone masonry tower. Yep. Um, and you're right, almost 200 years old. It was built in 1827. Mm -hmm. And the beacon is on top. You can't access it from the inside. You have to climb a, a ladder, ladder on the exterior to get to it. Yeah. If I have not heard from anyone thinking that it's an actual occupiable lighthouse. Right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very historic and, uh, you know, uh, important, not just uh, for navigation, but just a, a really well-known structure in that area. You see it from Bailey Island and Casco Bay and in other places. And, uh, you know, something I, I think a lot of people are aware of, uh, even though it's not a, not a lighthouse, so still needs to be taken good care of for sure. Exactly. It is on the National Registry of Historic Places. So mm -hmm. it does, which is why we're putting it out through the NHLPA. So uh, let me throw this one out up for grabs. When these lighthouses are transferred through the NHLPA, are the new uh, stewards, the new owners required to follow certain preservation standards? Uh, yeah, the deed, when GSA issues the deed, it will have what we call historic covenants. And those covenants are uh, the guideline uh, for any kind of improvements made to the property. And those improvements are also vetted in accordance with the State Historic Preservation Office. Mm -hmm. Each state has their own SHPO, we call them. Uh, so right. that, that, that th those are the standards to, with regard to the historic characteristic of the property. Okay. Uh, so let's get back to the auctions. There are four lighthouses currently that have been announced. The auctions haven't actually started, I believe, on these, but uh, there are four lighthouses that will go up soon for uh, online uh, through online auctions. Those are Cleveland Harbor, West Pierhead Light, Ohio, Keweenaw Waterway, Lower Entrance Light in Michigan, and two in Connecticut, Penfield Reef and Stratford Shoal Lights. Can somebody explain the process of how these auctions work exactly? Sure, I'll take that. Um, Anthony here. So, you know, how are auctions work in a nut nutshell? Let's fast forward past, you know, any marketing and assume we have some interested parties. We have our auction platform, realestatesales.gov. And, um, I always explain it that this platform works kind of akin to eBay, um, except it's for real estate. Um, you know, we'll have a registration deposit, a bidder will need to send us, um, usually in the form of a cashier's check, but we can take card under a certain amount. I believe it's right under 50K, you know, and that allows them to get registered. Once they're registered, um, the property will have an opening bid amount, which is the minimum opening bid that must be placed on that property. Following that, each bid will have to be up in a certain increment. So let's say the opening bid's $50,000, increments are $5,000, the next bid will have to be $55,000, and so on and so forth. Users are able to set proxies so they can kind of set it and forget it. And it updates real time. It's pretty cool to watch once these things get rolling, but you know everyone can see it the second it happens. And finally, when the timing's right, we'll set an end date. And once you're within 24 hours of the auction closing date, any bid made in that time frame will roll it forward one business day. Whereas, you know, on eBay, you might see something roll a few minutes or maybe an hour, depending on what the product is. Thus, if there's continuous bidding, you know, it can keep rolling for quite a few days. It's all kind of property dependent. I wouldn't say there's some average we could give. And this really allows this, this 24 hour extension really allows interested parties to have ample time to decide if they want to financially continue the 24 hours really makes it so you can't game the system. You can't really just wait till last minute. It's not going to make a difference. You're not. So there's, there's just no gaming. It's very open and transparent and it yields competitive results in the best interest of the taxpayer, I'd say, mm -hmm. in the property. Yeah. Oh, I've watched these auctions over the years and often, uh, like you were saying, there might not be a lot of activity for quite a while. And then when it's announced that it's, it's going to be ending, all of a sudden <laughs> There's this flurry of, uh, you know, the uh, com competitive uh, bidding people against Definitely. each other. And the the amounts they've been sold for are kind of all over the map, I think, as low as maybe $20,000 up to almost a million dollars for Graveslide in Boston Harbor. Uh, it's always interesting to see what happens. And uh, with Graves, I happen to know the two people who are bidding against each other or drove the bidding up so high <laughs> on that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, kind of fun to watch. Thank them for that, Jeremy, for us. <laughs> okay, I'll thank Dave. Uh, Dave, Dave. Dave Waller and uh, 
uh, Bobby Sager and Bo <laughs> Bobby who lost out in the last uh, bit of the bidding uh, is now a partner on that too. So they actually work together on it. So they, they right. came together for the good of uh, the lighthouse and done a great job there. So when somebody buys a lighthouse at auction through this process, do they f have to follow the same standards that you described, uh, the same preservation standards? Yes, Jeremy, those historic covenants run with the land. The only difference, I believe, is the reverter clause under the NHLPA comes out with mm -hmm. a public sale. Okay. But if there is a public sale, you know, most of these private owners have done a great job. But if somebody, you know, if 10, 15 years go by and absolutely nothing, nothing is done with the property, can it ever revert? Even if it's sold at auction, can it revert to the federal government? Unfortunately, it's a case by case. We do not want the property. We, the government, do not want the property back. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of a public sale. It conveys out of federal ownership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, public sale, it, it, um, uh, it, it, it's guided under those, again, the historic covenants for the property. Fortunately, as I mentioned, uh, you know, and again, I know many of these these owners who bought the lighthouses at auction, and most of them are doing a, a great job, really an exemplary mm -hmm. job. And that's the good news. There are a few light stations in the United States that actually serve as homes for Coast Guard district commanders, one of those being Hospital Point Light in Beverly, Mass, uh, near Boston, where the, the, uh, the commander of the first Coast Guard district lives there with uh, their, their family. Those lights, another one is Alki Point Light near Seattle, or in Seattle and uh, Washington, where the commander of that district lives. Those light station properties have not gone up for transfer, and I imagine they probably won't in the foreseeable future because of the, the people living there. And I'm wondering if there are other cases that any of you know of where uh, the Coast Guard might be retaining them uh, into the foreseeable future. I don't know specific lights, but I do know that any light station that the Coast Guard still has a mission need for, they're going to retain and will not be put on the NHLPA for yeah. disposal. And uh, there's probably some others in addition to the ones where the commanders live, but I guess uh, that's for the Coast Guard to know. <laughs> right. It's up to the land holding agency to decide sure. whether they want to retain the property or not. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. What else do you do uh, in your position with the GSA? Are you uh, obviously you're involved in other kinds of property disposal? On a, I don't know if you just want to say something about like on a daily basis, what else might you be dealing with? Like today, for instance, uh, any, any of you want to grab that one? Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, you know, some of my other projects at the current moment, besides the lighthouses, um, you know, I've been fortunate, I guess, enough to work on two super fun sites. So that involves a lot of meetings with other regulatory agencies because um, of all the environmental factors um, and risk involved. But it's really cool, you know, when, when they finally get to the end stage, you know, seeing something that was once contaminated being put back into productive reuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's great. That's really important. I would say my favorite property I've been working on with, it's an army property. Uh, and that's the beauty of this job, Jeremy. We handle property from the variety of the federal agencies, you know, from the VA to the army to the Department of Energy. It, it, we're all over the map. And, and my favorite property has been out in Minnesota. It was a super fun site as well. An old army ammunition plant started with about 800 acres and went down to the last 60. So that's been a long, long road of conveying property. Yeah, most of my current properties are actually other Coast Guard properties. So other housing properties that they have. So I've been getting to know a lot about their housing authority, which is different than the Property Act, which is also different than the NHLPA. There's a lot of different authorities that you can dispose of a property. So working with the Army is different than working with the Coast Guard versus GSA Property Act. Well, that, that's very, very helpful. Interesting to hear what else you're doing. I have one final question. And this is, I'd like all three of you to answer this. And this is for bonus points, okay? And that question is, uh, how do you like working with Lighthouse Properties? Uh, and maybe you want to compare that to other the other work that you do. Uh, is it more interesting, less interesting, or, you know, whatever you want to say about it. How do you like working with Lighthouse Properties? I'll go first. I, I, the, the, they are the most unique. Uh, 
and 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 everybody loves the lighthouse, Jeremy. You know that. So it really is a uh, <laughs> a nice match when we get some of these lights that are just so you know stunningly beautiful. The, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, so I, I I would put a lighthouse right up there with anything else, including a super fun site. Uh, uh, you know, just a different different level of energy. You know that kind of thing. A different customer totally. It's a nice match. It keeps things interesting for sure. Certainly gets uh, probably more press than just about anything else. You know, Correct. With. Yeah. Correct. So, Sonia or Anthony? Yeah, I'll just add to a little bit of what Kevin's saying with everybody like, likes a lighthouse. You do get interest from a whole variety, diverse set of people that wouldn't normally be aware about GSA or our program. Um, so it does keep things interesting. I actually had a friend tell me she heard through Instagram that they were giving away lighthouses at the federal government. So it reaches everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is, uh, again, there's a misconception, I think, with a lot of people, oh, the government's giving away lighthouses. I just, I get emails all the time from people like I did the other day, somebody saying, uh, my father loves lighthouses, and he, he'd like to uh, own the Plymouth Light. How does he go about this? Uh, so uh, I have to explain a little bit about the process. Anthony, anything you want to say sure. to that question? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, you know, with our job, generally speaking, we get to travel to a lot of cool places within the region, definitely some remote areas. For me, a lot of the pro projects tend to be, you know, the cooler the spot, the more fun it is because you get to go out and visit it all the time. And luckily for us, lighthouses provide some pretty cool spots. Um, <laughs> it's always fun getting a ride out on the ocean or, you know, going to some bluffs in Maine. You know, they say we get a lot of interest, but, you know, everyone's happy. Like they say, everyone likes a lighthouse and that's, that's always a bonus. I would say so. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a good place to uh, to bring this interview to a, a close. Where do people go online to to learn more about this whole process? The propertydisposal.gsa.gov would mm -hmm. be our homepage, and on that page there is a lighthouse section. Yeah. Other sections with regard to real property, but that would be a good start for uh, yeah. for, for for GSA in particular, Jeremy. I would say for the auction platform. Like Anthony said, it's it's that realestatesales.gov. And on top of that, there's also uh, another website, uh, gsa.gov slash lighthouses, that would provide similar information with regard to the notice of availability and our auction platform. Mm -hmm. All right. That's extremely helpful. Thank you. Kevin, Anthony, and Sonia, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I know you guys are all really busy with your jobs, and I appreciate you taking part of your, your Friday uh, out for this. And uh, I'm sure people listening will have learned a lot about the, the NHLPA process. So uh, good luck with everything Lighthouse related and everything else you're doing. And again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Same here, thank Jeremy. You. Thank you. Thanks again to our guests today, and I also want to thank Paul Hughes, Regional Public Affairs Officer for the GSA's New England region. Paul had a lot to do with making today's interview possible. So next, Cindy, I'd like to tell our listeners about a few upcoming events. Right. On July 1st, there will be a Boston Harbor Lighthouse cruise with the National Park Service, taking passengers close to Boston Light and Graves Light. There are more of these cruises happening on selected dates through mid-September. To learn more and to buy tickets, go to allevents.in, that's I-N as in Nancy, and search for Lighthouse Cruise with Boston as the location. The Toledo Harbor Lighthouse Preservation Society in Ohio is having a Sunday evening lighthouse dinner cruise on July 9th. Mm. Check toledolighthouse.org for details. The Thatcher Island Association on Cape Ann, Massachusetts, is having a lighthouse sunset cruise on August 1st. You get to see five historic light stations on this cruise, including the famous twin lights of Thatcher Island. Check out thatcherisland.org, that's T-H-A-C-H-E-R island.org, to learn more. And don't forget that boat tours to Baker's Island Light Station in Salem, Massachusetts, have started for the season. Enjoy a cruise from Salem past rugged coastline, harbor islands, and five lighthouses to Baker's Island. Go to bakersislandlight.org to learn more. And here's something a little different. 
On July 8th, there will be a live concert at the Point San Luis Lighthouse in California. It will feature Carbon City Lights, an alternative rock band. The frontman of the band was a contestant on NBC's The Voice. Go to Point San Luis, that's S-A-N-L-U-I-S, PointSanLuisLighthouse.org to find out more. I also want to mention that our local lighthouse here in New Hampshire, Portsmouth Harbor Light, about 10 minutes from where we're sitting here at the uh, semi-luxurious Bluefish Boulevard studios, (laughs) Uh, Portsmouth Harbor uh, Light, uh, unfortunately, uh, the tours there are still on hold. Uh, The walkway that provides access to the lighthouse, uh, 80 or so foot wooden walkway, was destroyed in a storm in uh, December, just before Christmas. The Coast Guard owns it, and they are rebuilding it, but sadly, we don't have a timeline for that project yet. That's right. So we're still hoping we might be able to salvage some of the tour season anyway. I sure hope so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels weird to it not does. Be, be over there at all so far this season. Sure does. So next, we're going to introduce another short interview. I've mentioned on the podcast a few times my idea for a big uh, kind of flash mob sort of event at lighthouses all over the country in early August, close to National Lighthouse Day, which is August 7th. As we're recording this, my friend Joe Rivers has been putting the final touches on an original song for this occasion. Uh, and uh, there's also going to be cash prizes for the best video submitted uh, from this uh, event, this dance event. I'm about to send all the details out about this event. By the time people hear this on uh, June 25th, they may have already received notice about this with all the details. I'm also going to be posting it on the USLHS News blog at news.uslhs.org and on the Society's Facebook page. I had a chat with Joe Rivers, who wrote the song, my old friend I've known for many years, I had a chat with them about the song and the event, and we're going to hear that interview now. I'm speaking with my good friend Joe Rivers today. And Joe, you know, I was just figuring out a little while ago, I believe we've known each other, if I figure it out right, about 36 years, if you can believe it. Wow. (laughs) Back to... Because I started at the Muse- Boston Museum of Science in 1987, and you were already there at that time, right? So, yeah, I've been there I... for about seven years at that point. <laughs> You're already a, yeah. a grizzled veteran by that time. So uh, definitely a lot of history there. So anyway, thank you so much for doing this today, Joe. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today. Thank You're you. You're welcome. It's, it's good to be here. So if we just start, we're going to talk about the song, of course, you've done for this, uh, this Lighthouse Dance event, but uh, maybe a, just a little bit about your background. Again, you and I met when we were both working at the Boston Museum of Science. Could you explain what you did at the Museum of Science for all those years? And also maybe a bit about your parallel career mm. as a songwriter, performer, music producer, also a photographer. Um, I had actually started my music uh, many years before, my dad was a, a drummer in the in the jazz days. So I I had no choice but to to learn a little bit about music. Before I had started at the museum, I was playing in bands around Boston. I started really young, and um, when I joined the museum, I actually joined the museum to just to make a little side money because I was going to make a record, mm-hmm. and the band broke up. <laughs> And luckily, I had a job, and, right. uh, and I actually found that I, I I liked. I was working in AV, and I actually liked that kind of work. Mm-hmm. And it progressed from setting up projectors and and movie projectors and microphones and all that to mm-hmm. actually producing material for exhibits and later producing material for marketing and in house education and those sort of things. Mm-hmm. While there, I was able to take advantage of um, an education program that the museum offered, and I went to MIT for a few years at night to learn electronics. Then I went and I learned, uh, took a special course, um, private school in recording engineering, mm-hmm. and then did two years at a world-class uh, recording studio as an apprentice and then as, as an assistant. I then left the museum for a few years, freelanced raised my kids around the, the year 2000 when 2001 when the, the economy was really bad I had no work at all and the museum called me up and said hey uh you want to start a new production department and I said sure mm-hmm. <laughs> so I went back there and I I 
spent another 16 years at the museum before I, I left and, and I'm freelancing again. Okay. And uh, I know you also do some work as a photographer, right? I do. I've always liked photography and it just, you know, doing video work, they, they go hand in hand to, mm-hmm. to frame a shot. And I, I look at the, the more um, artsy side of, of, um, of photography. The work I did at the museum as a videographer and photographer um, was very um, cut and dry, mm-hmm. you know, interviews and, and single camera work to describe something for an exhibit. There's an art to it, but it's not very artsy. Right. Well, you definitely uh, you're you're an artist uh, in in many ways in many uh, different fields. So uh, you and I have done projects together in the past. I remember I think it was circa 1996, 97, somewhere in that mm-hmm. area, where I I did a CD-ROM on main lighthouses. Oh, and, yes. And you helped me put the music together for that. Uh, I don't know if anybody listening remembers what a CD-ROM is at this point. <laughs> they kind of the internet kind of killed informational uh, seed and entertainment I, CD-ROMs. Yeah, I know you you worked so hard on that. I remember. I did, and I um, sold one or two, but um, it was kind of the, in many ways, the launch of my my career. You know, it was only a few years after that that I started working in lighthouses full time, so that that helped me really get into it. Um, aside from the fact that hardly anybody bought the thing, but that's okay. It kind of launched my website as well. So and um, all anyway, those Edward Rose Snow videos. Yeah, that videos. was before that was before that. But um, that quite yeah, that helped me get me into lighthouses as well. But anyway, it was fun working with you on the music for that. So and you provided some musical sort of uh, interludes or bridges that I use in the podcast often. Four years ago, when I started the podcast, you uh, gave me several of those played on guitar, played by you, uh, and I still use them pretty often. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you for that. And now we've been working together on this new project. Uh, You've done a song, an original song that you wrote and performed uh, called Meet Me at the Lighthouse, which we're using in this uh, National Lighthouse Day dance event. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about that. When I approached you about it, why did you decide to go ahead with it? Some of it is is probably from you. My exposure to lighthouses through you. I at first I was I wasn't sure what I could contribute to the project, and um, I remember in our initial conversation I took a lot of notes, and I realized yeah I, I after a little research I realized I could I could find a. a um, a different voice than you know a lot of the, a lot of the lighthouse songs were very romantic um feeling and and um you know there was a lot of hope in some of them but i thought i wanted to i wanted to approach it sort of for for what you told me about the, what the event was going to be like and that's where I, I i came up with the idea of bringing people together at the light and that's where the the, the, the title meet me at the lighthouse came mm-hmm. about yeah well, yeah, you're right. Most uh, lighthouse songs are are either kind of like you said, romantic. They often tell a story. Uh, it might be a lighthouse keeper's relationship to the lighthouse or something like that, or they're spooky. You know, that's the other. Mm. It's sort of the same thing with movies that involve lighthouses. Either they're very romantic or they're very spooky. But yours is more upbeat. It's really it's 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 got some of that romanticism is in it, but it's uh, it's just a very upbeat kind of celebration of lighthouses i think mm-hmm. in a way w- well what was the feel you were kind of after when you wrote the song well i actually wrote meet me at the lighthouse was the third song i started for this project and the other two just didn't have what i was looking for they were okay and some i had need to have something kind of visual in my head that first line of being out on the horizon and where the, the sky meets the sea. When I saw that, I, I it was my picture, mm-hmm. you, you know? And um, I actually called a friend of mine who's um, a boat captain. And I said, when you're out on the ocean, you're trying to get home and you see a lighthouse, what do you feel? And, and I talked to him about that a little bit. He wasn't very romantic about it. He was very, <laughs> you know, matter of fact. Yeah, practical. Um, really. Very practical, you know? But um, I, I think what the rest of us feel about lighthouses and how they save lives and they continue to save lives, I think 
that was really was very important to this to this song. But again, I didn't want to make it romantic. I wanted to have a song with some hope, but I wanted to have something that that brought people together. You know, mm -hmm. that, that we're all celebrating um, what a lighthouse is, what it does, what it means to you know seafarers to to everyone. Yeah. So that's um. It, it it took a little bit. I remember I sent you a um a a one verse and chorus demo mm -hmm. just to make sure that it was on the right track. And when you said, I think you got something here, I, I was able to just it just flowed after that. Mm -hmm. I think I wrote several verses and just whittled it down to what we have now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you definitely accomplished what you were after there with the the themes. Um and uh it's also of course danceable which was important for this because uh, this is a dance event. So if it was something like a slow ballad or something, that wouldn't really work. Yeah, so it's got a, it's got a, it's got a, it's very upbeat and it's got a strong beat to it. Mm -hmm. The beginning of it, every time I hear it, it makes me think of Springsteen. I don't think you intended that necessarily. No. It makes me think of Born to Run or something, the, oh, the yeah. opening dr drum beat and, and the start of the song. Overall, it's not much like that, but it, it makes me think of that. But it, yeah. Yeah. Um... But that's sort of his born to run is kind of an anthem in a way. Well, that's and what this, this is kind of yeah was going for that anthem, that majestic kind of feel, the mm -hmm. a, a celebratory. I mean, when you when you had said we want to do this dance thing, I thought, well, I don't do disco, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I'm not going to do it's not going to I'm not going to try to fake rap. Well, most of our a lot of our listeners wouldn't be interested <laughs> if it was a rap song or a disco song. I think, so. yeah. Yeah. So um, I did what you know. I worked in a genre that I felt comfortable in and knew. So, rock. Yeah. 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 Um, well, it's definitely a, you got a sort of a vintage rock feel to it, I think. So let me ask you a, a final question, okay? Is there anything you'd like to say to listeners who uh, might be somewhat intrigued, maybe thinking uh, maybe this is something I want to take part in? What would you say to them? Any anything you want to say uh, to kind of convince them they should take part in this event? Lighthouses bring unity, and they're a calling, a visual calling, and for people to gather or to or to migrate to. Or, you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. It's like a moth in a flame, but. <laughs> um, and I, I just but, want to interject here. I've been uh, there's been a lot of discussion. At least I've thought a lot about this, and I've discussed it with some people. The world is a little crazy right now. I think that may be an understatement, and we need positive symbols probably more than ever. So you know, we wonder true. sometimes: or is it is it still worth preserving lighthouses in this world with so much going on? And my feeling is, yeah, more than ever, it's important that we do that. Oh yeah, they're like a monument. Mm -hmm. Each one is unique and they're, they're a symbol. They're not a symbol of vanity. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a symbol of hope mm -hmm. and, and trust because you got to trust when you're out in the ocean that it's, it's going to bring you home. So yeah, I, I, and the, the people who, who you, you meet at lighthouses, they're, they're usually great people. You know, there's, they're, they're all there for a common, a common thought, a common cause. So, Absolutely. Um, I'm yeah. looking forward to it. I, I, I don't know which lighthouse I'm going to go to that week. Okay. I was going to ask, I hope you and <laughs> Sherry are going to do a dance and maybe your kids. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you can convince, convince them, but and your, um, your daughter doesn't live very close, right? Where's, no, where's she's she? 3,000 miles away. That's what now. I thought. Yeah, yeah. But you and Sherry should, should definitely do a dance. Yeah, maybe uh, Ned's Light or... or well, you use Situate Light on the South Shore of Boston as your uh, thumbnail or cover for the song. So mm -hmm. that's not that far from you. So maybe no, it's you not. That it's one. great. Great light. Yeah. I know people there. So maybe we can set you up with, with them. So you can do combined efforts. But anyway, Joe, the song is perfect. Uh, I couldn't ask for more. And uh, I think it's perfect for the event. And of course, it's always a pleasure working with you uh, over the years. So great to to always get back and in touch and work on something. So thank you so much for, for doing this whole thing. And thank you for talking to me today. Well, thank you, Jeremy. You take care. Looking for a safe return from our 
I want to wish everyone a happy summer. To quote peace activist and Nobel laureate Betty Williams, when all else fails, take a vacation. Good advice. <laughs> happy summer. We will be back with a new episode next week. For now, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Far we may travel, whether right or for wrong, hear the sirens calling, their seductive songs. Hand me a lantern, I'll stand at the bar.